Okay, I think we can get underway now. Greetings, everyone. I'm Vince Staley, Executive Director of Media Impact Funders, and I want to welcome you to our monthly Journalism Funders webinar today on supporting DEI efforts in journalism. Uh, I'm happy to note that this is a very hot topic uh, in the field uh, among funders, uh, and it's a topic that we've been paying a lot of attention to recently in in, in, in recent programming and in, in coming programs as well. Um, in addition to today's webinar, uh, we recently hosted the launch of the Borealis Racial Equity Fund for Journalism um, in uh, New Orleans at the Online News Association Conference, and Farai was with us, Farai today was with us uh, for that uh, very exciting event. Um, and we published a, a report on, on that on our website as well, which will be uh, available on the link on the chat function there. Um, we're also going to be having a very robust track of programming around DEI efforts at our annual journalism funders gathering in San Francisco next week. Um, and so stay tuned uh, if anyone's not going to be there, stay tuned for uh, more information coming out of that meeting as well. But today's, uh, for today's program and discussion, we're very fortunate to have with us Lauren Pabst, who is a senior program officer for the MacArthur Foundation in journalism and media to lead us in our discussion uh, today. And MacArthur has been really a leader in supporting diverse expression for many years. And Lauren's been on the forefront of that work at MacArthur. I'll just note for logistical purposes that we encourage participants to offer questions and there's a, a button on the top left of your screen where you can uh, uh, offer a question. We'll monitor it, that throughout the discussion today and um, make sure to take care of all questions. So thank you, Lauren. Take it away from here. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vince. Um, I'm really, really glad to be able to moderate this conversation. Um, and, you know, as, as mentioned, uh, Ed MacArthur, uh, strategies for supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion have uh, increasingly become a key part of our work. And I know that, that many of you that have joined on the webinar today as well are also uh, deep within thinking about how to apply um, that in the work that you do as well. So I do also just want to acknowledge that we're in a really incredible and exciting time of abundance in terms of new voices uh, in philanthropy, new placing of value, uh, new ideas and new initiatives to support journalism that centers the critical perspectives and civic needs of communities of color. Um, and, you know, just speaking from MacArthur, we're really grateful to have the opportunity to learn from what the work our colleagues are doing. So just wanted to mention that. And um, I will take the moderator's privilege to kind of share with you a quote uh, to sort of help ground our, our conversation. Uh, it's a quote that stayed with me uh, quite a lot in terms of helping to guide this kind of work. Um, and it is from Marcia Smith, who's a philanthropic leader and co-founder and president of Firelight Media. Uh, she said this in her keynote speech at the 2016 International Documentary Association Getting Real Conference. And she said, inclusion is an urgent proposition for the country and for the democracy. It's not a matter of being nicer or fairer. It's really a question of whether our country will unravel. So on today's webinar, we are going to hear first from Farai Tadea, a program officer for creativity and free expression at the Ford Foundation. She's going to share with us an overview of the racial equity and journalism some fund. Uh, then we're going to turn it over to John Sawyer, Executive Director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, Crisis Reporting, excuse me, who will talk about the educational outreach partnership between the Pulitzer Center and the New York Times on the 1619 project. And then finally, Lashara S. Bunting, Director of Journalism at the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, will tell us about Knight's grant of $1.2 million to the Maynard Institute to develop in-depth transformation program for news organizations to help them establish more equitable and inclusive workplaces. So we have a really packed agenda for our webinar. Um, we will have time after our speakers to devote to questions, but we would also like this to be a conversation as Vince mentioned. So 
please ask questions throughout the presentations using the Q&A app, which you can find on the bottom of your screen. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Farai uh, to tell us more about the Racial Equity in Journalism Fund. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm actually posting in the chat app uh, the link to the R Racial Equity in Journalism Fund, and I hope we can put that out to everybody. Um, the deadline is October 30th, so it is nigh upon us. But really, let me back up and talk about the origin of this. Um, I've been in grant making for two years, two years and one month, um, almost exactly. And I got into it because I had spent 27 years as a journalist and some of those years also as an academic. And I had gone to the Shorenstein Center at Harvard and wanted to do some analytics on uh, basically race and gender representation in the political press corps. And I picked a sample of organizations and less than half of them, after two and a half months of me bugging them for numbers, less than half of them gave me the numbers. One of the organizations that gave me the numbers said, what are you going to do with them? And I said, what I'm going to do is research. You know, I actually want to learn something. Um, they had particularly poor diversity numbers. I won't reveal their name, but they did actually give me the information. And what I find is that there's an incredible lack of evidence-based research that tells us how um, diverse staffs, diverse content, and fiscal revenue all fit together. And it's, you know, to be frank, our fault as, as a journalism industry. Because unlike, you know, say computer programming where you're constantly doing analytics, journalism is almost the opposite. We ask everyone else to disclose information, but we often don't want to disclose it ourselves. And when I made the decision to come to Ford after being recruited to be part of the, the pool of applicants, I thought, well, um, research doesn't seem to be able to move the needle as much as I would hope. Let me try money <laughs> and, and using money as a tool. Um, and then once I got to philanthropy, I discovered it wasn't as simple as just being able to give away money. It was being able to really analyze what it meant to be a grant maker and to make good investments. And I love the way you started, Lauren, by talking about how critical um, having a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens is to democracy, civil society. And, you know, I would argue, although it might sound like hyperbole, the survival of the human race. You know, we are at a point now where we have um, some existential crises. You can see what's going on in Chile. You can see the rise of authoritarian governments across the world. And journalism is a field that can help um, enlighten and, um, and provide us with potential solutions to some of the crises of civil society. So to pivot directly to this, this question of our fund, um, for many reasons, the Ford Foundation really had to think long and hard about how many grants we were making. If we make too many grants, then we become just, you know, we can't interact with our grantees. But the argument that I made successfully was that if we don't have grants that are for smaller people of color led organizations and organizations doing media equity, then making only large grants would reinforce some of the patterns we see in funding, where uh, a new report from the Democracy Fund found that only 8% of journalism philanthropy goes to organizations with a DEI focus. It's slightly better than it was before, believe it or not, but when you consider that 37% of Americans are people of color, that's not exactly sparkling new. And so one of the things that I think is really important to understand is that our, um, our journalism philanthropy is not leading us where we need to head in America's future. So the Borealis Fund, again, October 30th is the deadline, and I would urge people to look at the requirements and apply, is really designed for, um, it, it can reach a, a range of media organizations, but it make space for some of the smaller and mid-sized organizations that serve the purpose of uh, racial equity in journalism and um, as well as you know potentially giving grants to larger ones so that our journalism 
philanthropy can begin to build journalism that reinforces civil society. And I'll wrap up by saying that we're on the cusp of the 2020 election and census cycle, and the timing for this could not be better. So I really urge people to go to Borealis Philanthropies website and go to the Racial Equity um, in Journalism Fund page. And even if it doesn't apply to you directly, to forward it, you know, ASAP because of timing and forward it around to entities that might benefit from it. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, Farai. Um, quick follow-up question. I recognize that one of the really um, exciting things that sets apart the, the racial equity and journalism fund at Borealis is, as you mentioned, it, it is accessible and, and welcoming to a lot of different sizes of organizations and uh, media entities that are structured um, maybe outside of the nonprofit model. So could you say a few words about how um, you're able to kind of still make that philanthropic investment in groups that may not have that uh, nonprofit status uh, tax-wise? Absolutely. I mean, one thing I should say is that um, there, there are a coalition of different funders who were involved in creating the Borealis Fund, um, and you can see who those are, um, but also that even entities that didn't join the fund are doing really important DEI work. So I don't want to say that this is the solution. There are many different types of solutions that many different philanthropic entities are involved in. Um, and at Ford, we are a grant maker that does make grants to select for profits. And that's a fork in the road. Some organizations that do journalism philanthropy only give to nonprofits. Some also um, make investments in for profits. We are one of those. But the Borealis Fund recognizes that the majority of people of color led media entities are for profit entities. And we felt it was really important to. Um, do not restrict the money for the Borealis Fund to nonprofit entities. And there's many reasons for that. First of all, you know, even applying for C3 status requires a certain amount of resources. So if you're running, um, you know, 75% of people of color led media entities have fewer than five employees. They are mom and pop shops, but they can be very high quality. You look at MLK 50, which is, um, a Memphis-based organization that really has one employee plus some freelancers, and they were created um, to do a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., but then realized that the depth of need in the Memphis community for news centered around African Americans was high. And, you know, um, so the, there are many smaller entities, including many for-profits, that really, uh, you know, find the process of becoming C3s arduous, or they just also want to have a piece of the pie. Like if someone can get stock ownership in the New York Times and own the New York Times, you know, in that case, many different, um, there are many different shareholders. But there are people who have gotten quite rich off of creating media entities. And I don't think that people of color should be shut out of being able to create wealth through media production. Um, of course, it's pretty hard to create wealth through media production, but if anyone is going to be able to do it, everyone should be able to do it. And so I believe as a matter of equity, also being able to choose the kind of fiscal entity you are is really important. Thank you so much. Um, that's terrific. Um, so we are going to turn now to John Sawyer from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And he is going to share more information about the collaboration with the New York Times on 1619. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you all uh, for this opportunity to be with you and for all the great work that, that these organizations are doing. Um, I want to talk about the, the 1619 Project and our work with the New York Times uh, to reach as many people as possible with that project. And uh, I think it, in terms of DEI, it, to me, what it, what it flags is, is, is the importance of collaboration and working not just in the journalism space, but also in, in education and the broader community. I'm going to try to show, I want to show some slides if I can 
make this work. Let's see how, how I'm doing. Um, hang on. Okay, so hopefully, are you all seeing the New York Times Magazine? Is it looking, showing up? Okay, so this is the Times in August. I'm sure everybody on the call probably knows about the special issue of the Times Magazine uh, that came out mid-August on 1619, led by Nicole uh, Hannah-Jones, and, and uh, re you know, ten attempt really to reframe how we look at American history. And, and the response to this has been phenomenal. And the Times editors say that it's the, the most ambitious project, they think, in the history of the New York Times. Uh, certainly for us at the Pulitzer Center, uh, it's the most ambitious collaboration that we've been part of. Uh, and it's been uh, thrilling to see how it's gone out and engaged so many people. Part of the, the reason it's worked so well is that the, the Times came at it from so many directions. So the, the, the same Sunday that they had the magazine, they had a special section for uh, 1619 in education, uh, part of it directed to younger readers and intended for uh, use in classrooms. They also uh, had Nicole do a five, six part uh, podcast series that, that just finished up, I think last week or this past week, and I believe is the most listened to podcast podcast in the country in the last two months, uh, which is sensational. At the same time, they produced a, uh, a, issue, a section, an issue of the, the weekly, the, the Times new television program on FX and Hulu that, that went up this weekend, uh, focused on the desegregation of New York schools, but again, with, uh, with Nicole and her colleagues working on, on 1619. Uh, we are the education partner for the weekly, and so we do the Pulitzer Center education team, we do lesson plans built around that show to, to reach into the classrooms and around the country. And, and what happened with the with the uh, 1619 project is that the Times editors asked us also to be the education partner on that. And so what you're looking at here is a, a page from the magazine announcing, you know, how you could work with the Pulitzer Center with our curriculum uh, freely available to anybody. Uh, to to engage in all of the issues in 1619. So we put that we put that out. We had it on the website. We started. Uh, we built the curriculum around it. Uh, we have a network of several hundred uh, middle schools and high schools and three dozen uh, universities, community colleges, HBCUs around the country. So we were actively pushing it with all of them. But thanks to the fact that we had the platform of the New York Times. Uh, we were reaching so many more schools that had never encountered the Pulitzer Center or our educational work. And so we had a chance to uh, bring in many, many schools that we had never, classrooms that we had never engaged with. And so by the end of the first month, this was a map that sort of shows the 167 schools. What the Times said to us was that they would make available to us as many free copies of the magazine and the special section as we could get schools and teachers to commit to using the curriculum. So in the first four or five weeks, we got 167 schools around the country uh, to do that. And, and, but this map is now outdated. Let's see, this is our conference room, which for several weeks was really turned into a shipping, trans shipping center because the Times was shipping us um, copies as we had requests from schools. And then we were reshipping it out to the, to the school partners. So that as of this week, we're now up to nearly 600 schools uh, around the country that are, that are actively used the, the curriculum. And then the bigger thing that happened was that we got the commitment from the, the school districts, the whole school districts in Chicago, Washington, Buffalo, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And they said, that if you give us you know, 100 copies per high school, in the case of Washington high schools and middle schools both, we will commit to using the, the curriculum in every high school. And so we shipped, I think it's over, I think 12,000 copies to Chicago, about the same number to Washington, five or 6,000 each to Buffalo and North Carolina. And so that, that what we're, where we're at now is that we're trying to take that, we're, we're raising money with the Times, trying to get a sponsor to do reprint, another reprint of several hundred thousand copies uh, together with printing the, the curriculum and then try to engage you know, Los Angeles, Houston, Miami, other cities, some where we've worked before, some not, 
uh, to get all of them engaged in using this in the second semester. But as an example, this is Chicago. The out we were with Nicole in Chicago two weeks ago, and she was at the Whitney Young Magnet School. The the one I just showed. This is all of the kids in the in the in the world history class with their with their copies, and just the power of having physical copies is amazing. That they're they're all engaged in it. They spent a month before we went to the school uh, working on the curriculum, and then. The, with the students and Nicole and Jake Silverstein, the editor of the Times Magazine, you know, had a, an, an entire school engagement with the, with, the, uh, with the issue of 1619. What's showing on the screen is, is one of the poems that was presented uh, at that session. There were four or five students who did that. And then we had Janice Jackson, the CEO of the Chicago Public School Systems, with us for the event, and, and she told the students there told us that this was the, the most important initiative in her four decades in education. Uh, we had Nicole the night before at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, another partner school of the Pulitzer Center. And then the same day after the Whitney Young event, we were at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, another partner, uh, with a focus there on mass incarceration and the work that we've been doing with the Art for Justice Fund. And so we had some of our activists and our own journalists on a panel with Nicole uh, sharing this work. The next day we went to North Carolina, which is, this is my home state and, and Winston-Salem, my home city. And, and uh, Nicole spoke to a thousand people, uh, about half black, half white, at Winston-Salem State University. And then earlier that day, uh, she and I presented at Reynolds High School, which is now a magnet school of the arts and one of our partners and a very special Special for me because it's also the high school I went to, and the, in the bottom picture here, the the older man about my age uh, asking the question is Harold Kennedy, who's a local attorney. He integrated my fourth grade class in my elementary school in 1961. We went to high school together, and so, and then we sort of talked with Nicole about the desegregation and resegregation of the schools in, in North Carolina. What we do in, in North Carolina and Chicago. Chicago both um, taught, we have an initiative called News Arch, which is an exploration of, of the intersection of journalism and art, trying to use art to engage with journalism or use art in the production of journalism. So at the, at the Reynolds uh, High School, the arts program there, this is an example of blackout poetry that was done with the 1619 issue. And, and you create this you know, short poem that's black people led this country uh, to the democratic ideals, yet we somehow uh, are enslaved, yet we somehow, yet we are somehow enslaved people. And then lastly, uh, this is also from the Reynolds High School art students. This is a response uh, to 1619, the Statue of Liberty in chains. And it has been, you know, what we're doing now is with the times, we are gathering the work from these student work from these hundreds of schools we hope that we will do a special issue uh, in early February, the beginning of Black History Month in the Times that will feature the best of that student work. We hope by then we'll know that we have the reprints available for a second mass round of, of distribution and that we'll be encouraging as part of that issue that many more schools around the country do this. So it's a, it's to me, it's kind of networks within networks. It's our network of, of journalists and and news outlet partners, but also all of the partners that we have in schools and uh, universities, community colleges that, that help us um, you know, really achieve the kind of engagement we all seek on these issues. So it's been a great, great project. Thank you, John. Um, not only an opportunity on the part of the, this project to reframe you know, American history the way we think of journalism and the function it, it plays in society, and also an, an incredible uh, opportunity for the educational field, uh, as we've heard. So um, I have a quick question. I just wanted to remind all of our participants to ask a question at any time using the Q&A app at the bottom of your screen. But um, for now, I was wondering, John, um, being in, in, in journalism organization um, that has this uh, robust uh, uh, capability and capacity to create these educational materials. Uh, can you share with us some more about what went into the crafting of the 1619 project curriculum? We have 
uh, impacts on history and sociology, education, arts, uh, so, so many cross-discipline and cross-subject implications. So uh, could you share with us how you, you know, who, who was there at the table crafting this curriculum? Well, we are, as you say, Lauren, we are a hybrid journalism education organization. So we, we've got five or six people on staff who do nothing but education. And they're, they're former teachers themselves, and they've had a lot of experience working with our network of middle school and secondary schools and some on the college level. And then we had people like Anne Michelle Boyle, who was the, the, the teacher at the, at the Whitney Young High School, who's been working with us for seven years. She is a fantastic teacher. She worked with us on the Times Projects on Climate Change last year in the Middle East several years ago. So she wrote some of the curriculum. Our team wrote some of the curriculum. Some of it was as basic as kind of a, you know, framing questions. You know, what, when did you first learn about slavery? How were you taught about slavery? And that's a really interesting discussion. Right away, you see that it's radically different depending on where you grew up and, and what kind of classroom you were in. And then we were able, what we're doing now is, is bringing in the, the arts part of this, sort of the podcast, the, you know, her, her, and the, there's great reporting. The Wesley Morris essays on music is great, but now we've got, you know, we've also got the, the podcast and we have the weekly so that you're able to bring in these, you know, shorter pieces that are you know, five, 10, 20 minutes long. That's, it's more digestible as a kind of point of entry for a classroom. So we're able to do a mix of, of, of short, or something you might do in, in the course of one hour, a sort of one night's assignment, and then getting a response, starting a, starting a conversation. But it's also something that you know, in some schools they're doing you know, two, three, four week uh, engagements. And we have one school outside New York that's doing, a, they're framing their, their whole curriculum this, this year built around that and other Pulitzer uh, reporting related to it. So there's a lot, you know, there's just, it's, it's as, it's as, the opportunities are as broad as the many partners we have, which is again, sort of the value of having this kind of network that you can draw on and learn from. Let me just jump in if I could, uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, a number of participants had difficulty signing on to the webinar in the first few minutes. So for those of you who have joined after that, welcome. And I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that we'll have a recording of this entire discussion, so you won't want to miss any of uh, Farai's illuminating thoughts from the beginning of the discussion. You can follow it on the recording. As well, we will be sharing all of the links uh, discussed immediately following the call or the webinar. And um, please also note that you can uh, offer questions by finding a button on your upper left-hand side of the, the screen and do uh, offer some questions. So thank you for that. Um, I also just wanted to jump in and say that if you go to Borealis Philanthropy, you can find information on the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund that you can go back and that will be explained, but the deadline is October 30th and I did want to emphasize that. And thank you so much for putting this together. Great, thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we're going to ask Lashara Bunting to tell us about the Knight Foundation uh, recent investment in the work of the Maynard Institute um, to kind of work with, with newsrooms on this really critical uh, question of, of creating uh, environments for leadership and for diverse uh, participation and uh, professional growth. So there's so much there. Uh, Lashara, take it away. Absolutely, thank you, Lauren. So um, I will just give a little bit of a quick background um, on myself and that'll help explain sort of how and why I'm so passionate about this, about DEI and about this project in particular. So I joined Knight about two years ago um, after a 14 year career at the New York Times and um, as an editor and then later as a senior leader doing transformation work. And one of uh, my experiences uh, as a professional journalist has been this, this frustration about diversity, right? This is an issue that so many organizations uh, continue to grapple with. And there are different approaches that, you know, uh, philanthropy, journalism organizations have taken to try to get at this issue. Um, and so, so I, I'm in this role at night, I'm very passionate about uh, how can we invest in projects and initiatives 
uh, that, um, you know, that support this. And that's why I'm very excited about the Borealis um, Fund as well, uh, because I think that's, that's, again, kudos to all my, my colleagues on that in particular. Um, for the Maynard Grant, um, it was a $1.2 million, um, uh, essentially one and a half year uh, grant. And what that covered was, is the, uh, the, the transformation embed, which is what I'll talk about. It also gives a little bit of money to them for a capacity support as well. And so when Maynard reached out to me a year ago, um, you know, we were talking or having a grantee meeting and I was like, what are you working on? I really want to give you, you know, give, give some money and support to Maynard, but I want to hear what you're working on. And uh, Martin Reynolds, one of the co-executive directors, one of the last things he mentioned was, you know, I have this idea for going into newsrooms and, um, and really embedding in, uh, in the newsrooms to help them with this issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, what, what's, what does your content look like? What are the HR practices in your newsroom? Um, you know, what's your, what's your uh, relationship with the community? Um, what are the, the numbers are saying that people are leaving? Why are they leaving? You're not able to attract as many people. Why is that? I don't know if anyone's familiar with Maynard's um, history. They have a very long history. They've been around about 40 years. And they will often go into newsrooms and do trainings. And so maybe they're there for a few days or a week. Um, and, and so they've had this really desire to go deep. And it's been, you know, six months, nine months, a year in news organizations and really helping them um, from the inside out. And so what I love about this project in particular is that, let me step back a little bit. For a lot of philanthropy, when we support DEI, it's pipeline programs, it's leadership development, it's for those people of color, right, who are in the industry. And those are all very important. You know, we, we should continue to invest in that. But when we think about the problems uh, of diversity and the lack of equity and inclusion in newsrooms, you know, I keep coming back to this issue as, you know, there's not enough money in the world to, to fix the systemic, you know, racism and the institutional racism and the bias, you know, that exists in these news organizations. And so essentially we're sort of funding around the institutional racism. What can we do to try to chip away at the big problem, right? And so this grant in particular, this program in particular, takes the onus off of the people of color to solve this issue, right? Um, Sort of, sort of, sort of knocks those like we have an issue in our news organization. Let's create a diversity committee, and and you know, and that sort of well-worn path. Um, this is an attempt to to really scratch that, and so the, taking the onus away from the people of color, right, the victims of the system, to fix it themselves, and puts it on the institutions, and requires them to have responsibility. Um, as it should be uh, for fixing, um, you know, the, the, the bad cultures that exist, the unwelcome uh, cultures that exist. So, um, you know, we hope that this is a pilot program with the grant. It's two uh, news organizations that, that we're going to test with. Maynard will put on an RFP um, to, to, to find the right news organizations that, that feel ready for this sometime this fall. Um, you know, we hope that other funders, and I have gotten emails and talked to other funders about this, uh, will invest in this program and sort of see this as another way to approach DEI outside of a pipeline program and to really um, make sure that institutions are, are um, take the responsibility and are held accountable and, and have the means to be able to, to really address this issue. And so if you are interested in learning more, I'm happy to get on a call. Um, and also connect you with, um, with the Maynard Institute. And eventually, in terms of sustainability, you know, their goal is for this to become, um, you know, a standalone business for them. And so uh, this could, you know, with the support, um, you know, of some philanthropy to get it started and launched, uh, you know, this could eventually become a consultancy uh, business for them. And so they see this as a, something that will be sustainable down the line. Thank you so much. Um, quick question on, and I know that the 
RFP from Maynard is forthcoming in terms of seeking uh, interested newsrooms. Um, but can you share a little bit with us from Knight's perspective about what would make a newsroom kind of a prime candidate for this mm -hmm. kind of uh, really exciting and intensive intervention. Right. I think, you know, it, again, this is Maynard's um, <laughs> uh, decision for sure, but in terms of, you know, the, the conversations that we've had as the grant was being developed, I mean, really it comes down to willingness, right, and leadership. Are they all on board? This is really hard work. I mean, let's just be clear. This is this requires um, leaders and news organizations to sort of lay bare, um, you know, the, the dirty laundry, you know, but, but I believe you can't fix a problem unless you admit to it. And so I, I think the first and primary, um, you know, sort of indicator of whether an organization is ready is if they're willing to do the hard work. Um, and, you know, we certainly have had a number of news organizations reach out to us at raising their hand and saying that they want, want to do it. I think, you know, you don't have to be a perfect news organization, right, to come in and have all the, have all the answers already. We know no one does, but, um, but I think it's just that sort of willingness um, to change is, is what's going to be key. Thank you. Um, so we've reached the point where we can officially open it up to questions from our participants on the webinar. I don't believe you'll be able to tell them to us verbally, but um, please use the Q&A app. Um, and I also wanted to invite our panelists, if you have questions of one another, um, to please feel free to pose those also. Um, and so while, while we're waiting um, for some additional uh, questions or maybe reflections from, from those of us uh, on the, our, in our online space uh, that we have for about 20 more minutes, um, I will ask, um, we have a panel of obviously three newsroom veterans. Um, and what we hear uh, a lot about is in the last couple of years at least, is this uh, narrative and the question of uh, the, the lack of trust in journalism that um, many are, are, are using as kind of a very expedient way of, of discounting facts. But this, this larger narrative as well of um, trust, trustworthiness journalism, uh, journalism that deserves the trust of communities. And um, there's also a, a real desire, I think, among the community of, of journalism funders and, and people working in the field that care about diversity, equity, and inclusion to um, not paint a, a overly rosy picture of the past when we try to think about how to articulate the, the real value of journalism, um, not for what it, what it has, recognizing the value of what it has been, but also articulating this really bold vision for a more inclusive future that, it, that, that does earn trust at every level. So I wondered if, if any of you have reflections that you'd like to share on that. And also we know that, um, uh, I wanted to just share that Farai has to move to another appointment in a few minutes. So uh, maybe Farai, did you wanna did you wanna do, take the first uh, cut on this question? Yeah, thanks so much. And you know, I will go back and watch the rest of the webinar after my next appointment. I just want to really thank Media Impact Funders and everyone on this call for being part of the solution. Um, which is to engage deeply on these questions of equity and inclusion. And I think what Lashara said about like not making people of color do all the work is really important. Because what I found in my career was very often uh, when I stood up for women or people of color, I lost some equity with my bosses because I became the troublemaker. This is something I talk about a lot with my friends who are what I call newsroom survivors. I have a number of friends who are um, of many different types, but particularly women of color and LGBTQ people of color who um, essentially you face a fork in the road where if you stand up for not just your specific moral values, but moral values that should be universal in this country of giving everyone a fair shot, then you're knocked down a peg because you're viewed as insubordinate to the power structure. Um, I could name any specific examples, but I won't. But I will say that at one newsroom, I was the only woman of color and um, all the other women were white, but because I was also the most senior woman, 
I did a ton of work for gender and it was um, it was not good for my career at that organization um, but what I really feel having done years of field reporting interviewing everyone from white nationalist and supremacists to racial uh, equity activists billionaires politicians um, you know during the um, uh, what year was that, the, the 2008 election season, during the South Carolina Democratic primary, I interviewed um, Clinton, Edwards, and Obama back to back over two days. You know, I've, I've, I've gone soup to nuts, and I've also gone to housing projects, et cetera. And I think that that breadth of being able and willing to engage with both powerful people and what are considered powerless people is critical because Power is not equitably distributed, but the reality is everyone does have power. Everyone shapes this nation. And very often what happens is that it's presumed that women and people of color or people who are outside of um, a heteronormative white male framework are supposed to do all the work of talking to the people who are presumed to be powerless. First of all, they're not powerless. They help shape this nation every day. And we can't have a nation that just focuses on any one gender, any one race, any one um, income level. I believe strongly that the present and the future are created, uh, are co-created in collaboration with many types of people. And so that's one reason why having this racial equity is so important. Thank you so much, Farai. Um, and thank you for joining us, if you're gonna have to leave us in the next uh, little while. Um, we do have a question uh, that I wanted to pose to the, the panel as well. It is from Sadia Zaman, the CEO of In Sp the In Spirit Foundation. And she asks, uh, this is a question for Lashara, um, how confident is Maynard in their ability to find a newsroom that will actually air the dirty laundry around DEI? <laughs> that is a very, very good question. Um, uh, they're, they're, they are very confident. I am very confident. I, between the, um, I'm only getting a fraction of the emails that they're getting from executive editors and, and managing editors about wanting, desperately wanting, and desperately wanting to be a part um, of this, um, of this initiative. I think it's understanding that it's not the sort of airing the dirty laundry to the industry, right? It's sort of, let's air it for ourselves. Uh, in 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 support of this goal of becoming a more equitable, um, you know, more open uh, newsroom, which is not something that 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 um, that happens. But I will tell you, I love to tell this funny story of um, I actually had someone text me <laughs> very late in the evening um, about this in particular. Like, how can I get a part of the? How can I become a part of this? Um, so there's definitely a, a desire. And I think because we're at a crisis moment and let's be clear, we are at a crisis moment when it comes to diversity, um, in journalism, uh, very, let me repeat that. We are at a crisis <laughs> moment when it comes to diversity in journalism. And so I think everyone who understands that, um, is, is willing to take these steps. Lauren, I have a question, if I may. Yes, please. One of the one of the functions of a media impact funders is to introduce these ideas from the experts and from the actors to everyone else who's in philanthropy. Um, what's an easy way to get in? Obviously, pooled funds are one obvious answer, but um, for for somebody who's trying to get in here, uh, how can we make it easier for them? That's for anyone. Oh. Well, I'll just say very quickly, because I'm I am going to have to sign off now, that you know, this is this is a very circular but unplanned that people should plug into your work at Media Impact Funders um, and should also plug into uh, funds like Borealis. But but what you do at Media Impact Funders really is a strong line of education and information and I've learned a lot from you since I haven't been in philanthropy for a long time. I believe in learning from many different sources, you know, um, I've learned from everyone who is on this webinar and um, it takes research and so partly 
um, just the way that I did as a journalist, put aside time, like literally block out an hour in your calendar to do some research on the topics that matter. Um, with that, I'm going to sign off, but I want to give great thanks to everyone. Well, let me thank you for that uh, unplanned advertisement, but also just to reflect, um, you know, in the mutual admiration society we have with Farai, we can only reflect to our members what everyone else shares with us too. So don't assume if you on the um, among presenters or anyone who's attending this webinar, don't assume that we know the good work that's happening in your neighborhood. Please share back to us so that we can share it with the community as a network. So thanks for that. So I could jump in here for, if I could. Um, the in that spirit, Vess, I wanted to share one other initiative that I put it on the chat, the Bringing Stories Home initiative that we started earlier this year. And it speaks to this, the questions of both Lauren's questions about how do you, how do you restore trust in media? And also how do you, how do you actually recruit newsrooms uh, to address not only DEI issues, but, but truly engaging with their communities. And with Bringing Stories Home, and there's a link to it in the chat space here, uh, we said we would make funds available uh, to uh, for big enterprise projects with outlets serving markets outside the major national media markets. Uh, and, and we've been astonished at the response. And part of what we said was that if you to apply for this, you had to have a plan for community engagement uh, through schools, community colleges, and just community groups, as well as the actual reporting. And so we've done... Uh, so far, I think we've commissioned about 25 or 30 of these projects from Flint, Michigan to Seattle to Tucson to Savannah to you know, all over the country, Hawaii and, and Alaska. There's a lot of interest in this, and we're doing it through an endowed fund so that part of the carrot to these news organizations is that we want to build a permanent relationship. But if you do it, if you go out and you actually help us plant our flag, use our education resources, uh, introduce us to schools and local colleges, community colleges. We'll do it again next year. So that you, and each one of those is an opportunity to remind your local community of the value of lo local journalism outlets. And so we hope over time, we help kind of rebuild their circulation base, the community uh, dependence on those outlets. Thank you, Jen. Um, I just wanted to see whether we had more questions or uh, inter-panel questions. And we have one question here. Uh, this is from Michelle Shrevinovitz. As a, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, as a funder reviewing proposals from news organizations, what should we be looking for to determine whether an organization has operationalized DEI? Beyond the makeup of their leadership and staff, is there a set of indicators that we should be using or questions that we should be asking up front? Well, I could, I could tackle that. I, mean, I think if I were doing it, I certainly would want to know what is your strategy? What are your results over the last year, two years, three years? What is your trajectory? I mean, are you, are you improving? Are you getting better? And, if you don't have a strategy, if you cannot answer that question, if you're not, whether it's, and, and it goes beyond staff, sort of in, in our case, it certainly applies to our grantees. What, what are the numbers like? And, 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 and what, is the, what is the diversity of the representation of our work in schools and universities? There are lots of ways to measure it, uh, but if an organization is not doing that, then they're not really serious. I think there's, um you know, beyond the makeup of the lead, you know leadership and staff, I would say in many ways that that data is crucial and it can tell a lot of different stories. So, um, you know, I would go beyond even getting what is the current, you know, racial gender makeup of your um, current staff, but I would ask, you know, how has that changed over the last, you know, X number of years? Uh, let's talk about retention numbers. Can you tell me, you know, who, have you had any high profile um, uh, departures in the last couple years that have been people of color? Um, you know, talk to me about the, the, the people who were all hired in the last year, you know, let me see the makeup of that. And I think it's just sort of in, in digging in that data 
it's going to unearth a lot of um, questions and potentially a lot of issues. Um, you know, I think diversity strategies and asking about that is another uh, great way, as, as John mentioned. Um, I would look at how they talk about their diversity strategy um, and um, and how they and I and I would want to hear how that's evolved over time because I think even in that conversation you'll be able to see um, sort of how serious uh, an organization um, is about it. Um, I would ask about um, how do they engage in their communities? Um, are there communities that they feel like they're not reaching and why? Um, and, um, and, I, and I would ask also, you know, have there been instances where, um, you know, communities have felt marginalized by your journalism and what did that look like and how did you, you know, how did you handle that? Um, I don't know to what extent this is, you know, I approach all sort of like funder um, uh, exploration like a journalist. So I make a lot, I don't read just what people submit to me. I make a lot of phone calls. I do a lot of reporting essentially. And so I would encourage you to um, to on your own also, you know, outside of whatever they do formally, um, to reach out to people and try to get the real deal essentially and understand both people who were, are there currently, but people who had recently left. I think those are really only the, the ways that you can start to, to, to get a, a a complete picture because these organizations will do whatever they can to make themselves look um, look great around DEI and again not you know we go back to, to what I talked about before you know you, they have to be willing to um, you have to see how willing they are to um, accept responsibility for for where they are and where they need to go. Hey Lauren can I just offer a quick reflection on Lashara's point I think it's a really important one more and more when we go into rooms full of uh, grant makers in journalism, I do a show of hands, how many are former journalists? And more and more hands are going up, which is a sign of the downturn in the newsroom, but it's also a sign of the opportunity in our field, which is a lot of people have those journalism skills. Don't be afraid to tap your inner journalist. If you're a former journalist, it's so important to do what Lashara thinks, which is not just to accept the kind of narrow framework of the work that a grant maker has, but actually bring those journalism uh, sort of uh, intuition and uh, you know the skills to to your work. So I, it's great to hear you say that, Lashara. Thank you, Vince, and thank you to John and Lashara. I also wanted to pick up on something that was mentioned by Lashara as well, which is this question of what has the diversity or lack thereof in your team meant for the work that you do? You know, how does it show up in your reporting? And um, I think that's, a, that's also a key critical piece of um, how we are, you know, how, how we're thinking about this, which is this is, uh, at the end of the day, this is gonna result in higher quality work and uh, work that brings perspectives to the table that are gonna move this industry forward. And um, that is also something that uh, it could be, you know, more worthwhile, as was mentioned, uh, having that conversation with the organization to think, see how they think about that. One thing I also just want to mention that we do have the power um, as funders. And if you find yourself in a position where you are funding um, someone that has had DEI challenges um, and, you know, I think there's a there, there's a couple things. A, do they even deserve the funding, right? Like how bad is the DEI um, funding? And I think it's important to use that as a measure, right? When you're evaluating um, proposals, if, if someone comes to you and they have a all white board and an um, all white leadership in 2019, that, that's, that's, that's highly problematic. Would you want to invest in an organization like that? I think that is a, a legitimate question. But for those who you think, look, there seem to be some problems, um, but I think there's something we can do here, you know, building into the grant, you know, you, you, depending on where you're at, there's potentially power in building into the grant some help. Um, you know, building in dollars for a consultant, building in, um, or saying, look, we'll give you one year, we want to see where you are after that, we're not going to do a multi-year grant. So I think there, um, there is, uh, we should use that, that, um, 
that the the power and the the role that we're in uh, to press on this issue in a more active way and holding these you know letting these news organizations know that look if you 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 know you want us to invest in your projects you need to reflect the community um, and it's no longer acceptable for you not to so I think it's also up to us um, to step up in that way. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to mention something, uh, which is, uh, you know, the Democracy Fund report was mentioned earlier. That's a great resource. There's also a framework that is, I believe, being uh, released by uh, Frontline Solutions uh, in terms of how to think about DEI journalism funding. Um, and I believe that will be made available to this group too. Um, an additional question that is, not really a question, uh, Nina Sashtev tells us, warns us maybe, uh, but she says, uh, one thing I think about constantly is that the same dynamics we see in the news orgs is the same we see in funder meetings. DEI workshops where the white people are scarce, et cetera. Panels about gender equity where the men are absent. How do we address the fact that philanthropy needs to walk the talk internally as well? I think that is a question. I think it's an excellent question. Um, so who has thoughts on this? Um, I think, you know, I'll, I guess I'll start um, very briefly and just mention, I think this is a critical point. And um, I think one of the things we can do as funders is um, be as transparent as we can about the DEI journey that our own organizations are on. Um, we don't want to be in the position of asking organizations to do things that we, we would, to hold, holding grantees to standards that we wouldn't hold ourselves to. And I know that there's a um, lot of complicated dynamics at play in all of the institutions that we represent, but um, I think, you know, this is going to be, I just really appreciate the question. I think it's something I'm looking forward to talking about at the upcoming Media Impact Funders Journalism Funders Meeting and beyond. Any other comments? I just really, I could not agree more. Um, you know, jumping from uh, journalism to philanthropy has been very, very eye-opening and, and interesting. And it is, um, it is very true to see uh, many of the same problems that existed there um, exist here. Um, you know, I've, I've had situations where, uh, you know, it's, it's, you just see, I've seen other funders treat me differently um, until they realize like, oh, she's from Knight or oh, she worked at the New York Times or oh, you know, so it's, it's, it's very, you know, I think the, the sort of same sort of unconscious bias, um, you know, that we um, issues that we see are very much alive and well in philanthropy. And I, I think there's an opportunity, um, you know, with media impact funders and um, webinars like this are certainly good. I think we always come come in, into that issue of the people who need to hear it aren't necessarily the people who are in the room. Um, so I think there's a lot more work to do there. If I could also just offer uh, a point that, that it is a delicate point to to grapple with. Um, you know, for John and me um, to be on this call grappling with these issues, we I think both share that it it really is important for us to be having this conversation with everyone else um, but there is also I think some tendency to say like why are we hearing from the white guys on a topic like this so that's out there and I think we have to have a little bit of a thick skin on, on, on that but also I think as a group we have to say it really is important for all of us to be in the conversation and to hopefully um, encourage people to uh, recognize the need for more inclusive power structures, but also equally in, in, in response, inclusive of the, of, the, um, of the legacy voices too, so that we can actually come to a, a more equitable distribution of that power. Anyway, uh, it's, I, I know that sometimes people look at a panel and say like, why are we listening to, the, to that guy? We have to have balance in all of these things, of course, but it can come up that way. I think that the trick is to be thick-skinned, as Ben says, but also to be, can you be thick-skinned and listening at the same time? And that's really- Absolutely. 
absolutely. And the point that uh, Nina's question includes as well, which is this is really all of our responsibility. Um, so I think we welcome people from different, all different backgrounds in terms of contributing to the work moving forward. So I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to turn it back over to Vince to close us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lauren, for moderating a great discussion, and Lashar and John for contributing, um, uh, and for I in her absence. But um, we're going to be paying attention to this issue uh, and, and really working on it hard next week together uh, for all the journalism funders that are going to be with us in San Francisco and in, in the coming months. We're not going to have a webinar in November. Um, we've got so many public programs going on that we're not, not going to try and do that with the Thanksgiving holiday and everything else. But stay tuned for information about December's webinar. We'll be sharing that with all of you um, very shortly as well. And so thanks, everyone, uh, and have a great day.